Let's close our eyes for prayer. A great God in heaven, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you because of all those who are here, and thank you for those who are in various places, various locations to study the word with us. We are praying, Lord, that you grant us insight into your word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look into the word, we pray that you look into our hearts so that you can match our hearts with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. And we pray, Lord, that the study of your word will be a great benefit to every one of us. So that, Lord, this study of the word will move us away from where we are to, what we ought, to where we ought to be. Be glorified tonight as we study your word together. Give us, Lord, the heart to concentrate and to focus our attention on your word and not on any other thing. We pray that those who have the tendency to have wandering thoughts, wandering eyes, and wandering hearts, that you help them, Lord, to center upon your word tonight so that your word will be of tremendous benefit to everyone. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we come once again to the study of the Word of God. And we're looking at Matthew chapter 5. We started a few weeks ago. And we're looking at this sermon on the mount. I told you last week that these verses we're looking at now, the form, the first part of the sermon on the mount, and they refer to as the Beatitudes. They are referred to as the Beatitudes because they give us the path and the way and the ladder to blessedness. That's what Beatitude actually means, great happiness or great blessedness. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. Stop there for a moment. The Lord Jesus Christ has been going about. And he has been teaching the people, preaching the gospel, and healing those who were sick. And because of that, many, many people were coming into the kingdom of God. They were believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ like that, you are a convert. But a convert is just like a baby. And a baby doesn't know much. A baby can't do much. And a baby can't receive, can possess much. And you move from being a convert to being a disciple. A disciple is a learner. A learner, somebody who knows that Christ the Savior, Christ the Lord, has a lot. You've just got a little thing. And now you need to get more from the Lord. That's why those disciples, they came out of the crowd, out of the multitude. And they came to the Lord Jesus Christ. They had the intention to learn. And I'm sure you are here to learn today. And you have the heart, the mind, the focus, the passion, and the intention to learn. And if you are like that, that means that you are a disciple. And these disciples haven't learned a little. They wanted to know more. They wanted to learn more. That's the reason why they came. This desire to learn more is the quality of a true disciple. And it's a sign of being alive. The disciple is that is alive will always want to know more. Or to learn more from the Lord, from the word of the Lord. And when the Lord saw the desire to learn in these disciples of his, and in the multitude that came unto him, we're told that he opened his mouth and he taught them. And what did he teach them? Come back to Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 3. Blessed are they, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit. Remember what we learned last week. That's different from those who are poor in society. It's different from those who are poor in social status. That's different from those who are poor in substance. That's different from those who are poor because they're in slavery. That's different from the people that are poor because they're sinful. That's different from people who are poor because they are just in servitude. The poor in spirit, the poor in their heart. Because of the humility they had, contrite heart, and they confessed their sins before the Lord, and they turned away from those sins, and then the kingdom of God becomes theirs. They enter into the kingdom of God. Then in verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, 
for they shall be comforted. Now you understand that word to mourn is to be sorrowful, is to grieve. And when people have either death or desolation or destruction, or they become destitute, destitution, then they are sorrowful and they grieve. And that grief or that sorrow is referred to as mourning. And so, this normal response to calamity, this normal response to sickness, this normal response to problems in life will come out in sorrow and in grief and in mourning. I don't know those who are over there outside our state, outside the head headquarters. I don't know what you read in your Bible reading today. But we read in our Bible reading Genesis chapter 49 and chapter 50 where Jacob the father of Joseph and the father of the rest of where he died and the people mourn that's always the response when somebody dies in the family a father a mother a child a wife a husband there is the response of mourning I want to show you something you see that mourning even though it's a natural response to the grief and the sorrow that people have when calamities happen to them the people of Israel, by the time Jesus came to this world, they had commercialized it. Can you imagine that? That mourning had become something commercial. That they were not mourning anymore in the normal sense. They were not sincere. They were not sober. They were not sorrowful. And they were not thinking of what really had happened to this family. And then they mourned. And a kind of, many, many kinds of mourners then came. I need to clear that for you because when it says blessed are they that mourn. It's not talking about these people that I'm talking about now that have turned mourning into something professional. Number one, there were professional mourners. Number two, there were page mourners. Somebody died in a family. And there were people that they actually go and pay them money. And they hire them and then they come. And then they will wail and cry and weep and mourn. This is not the kind of people we're talking about. Number three, there were those who are playful mourners. They just did it for drama. And they just did it for play. Number four, there were profane mourners. They were actually profane, perverse, evil, sinful. And yet, they took money in as if it was real job. Number five, there were perverse mourners. Number six, presumptuous mourners. Number seven, proud mourners. Let me show you in the word of God. The professional mourners. We're looking at Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, we're looking at verse 28. 38 rather. Mark chapter 5, verse 38. Here we read the word of God. It tells us in verse 38, it says, And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and sees the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he says unto them, Why make ye this ado? Weep and, and weep. The daughter, the damsel, is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Can you see how they switch over very quickly from weeping unto laughter? Because they were just professional mourners. They were not serious about it at all. So when you read in the word of God, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. These professional mourners were not included. Now number two, the page mourners. Je 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 Jeremiah chapter 9. In Jeremiah chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 17, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider ye and call for the mourning women. They, they actually paid them. And the Lord was saying in an ironic way, he said, call for them. That's what you pay them to do. Therefore, call for the mourning women that they may come and search for cunning women that they may come. And then in verse 18, it says, And let them make haste and take up a wailing for us, that our eyes may run down with tears, and our eyelids gush out with waters. For a voice of wailing is heard out of Zion. How are we spoiled 
we are greatly confounded because we have forsaken the land because our dwellings have cast us out yet hear the word of the lord O ye women and let your ear receive the word of his mouth and teach your daughters wailing and every one a neighbor lamentation you see they even passed it on to their daughters it was a professional thing and they paid them and that was all they did for for work they just found out where somebody had died and then they go there you know while they are coming on the road you even see it sometimes in our society today and there are some countries where you have that very much pronounced when they are coming from their houses they are you know talking and laughing and having a nice time then when they get near that place where they are paid to go and mourn then all of a sudden they burst into tears and they wail and tears will be coming out it's a professional sin and when jesus said blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted he wasn't referring to these people who are professional or the people that are paid to mourn number three the playful mourners i'm reading to you from uh, mark matthew rather matthew chapter chapter 11 Matthew chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the marketplaces and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. Just children. And the, the Lord said, This is a childish generation. This is a foolish generation. This is an unthinking generation. This is a generation that doesn't think at all. And they're like little children that take mourning for play. And there were playful people like that, dramatic people like that. They just dramatize the mourning. And when Jesus said, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. He wasn't talking of the people that turn mourning into a play or into drama. Number four, the profane mourners in, my, in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 11. Malachi chapter 2, reading from verse 11. Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord. Did you hear that Judah? had profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and has married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears and with weeping and with crying and with crying out, is so much that he regarded not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Do you see these people profane? They come to the altar of the Lord. And for them, whenever they approach the Lord, they must approach God with crying and with weeping and with mourning. After all, you know, it says, Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted for us to receive the comfort of God. They go before the altar of the Lord. They were profane. And they took the serious sin and the principle of holiness and the message of the Lord. They turned that around and they turned it into a profane thing, something to jest about. And they will cry and cry and cry upon the altar of the Lord. And the Lord said, I've rejected them. And the judgment will come upon them because they were not serious with the things of the Lord. Number five, the perverse mourners. The perverse mourners. In Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah chapter 59, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah 59, reading from verse 11. We roar all like bears and mourn. We mourn so like those. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation, but it is far from us. Go back to verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated between you and your god and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear 
For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue have muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for, for truth. They trust in vanity, and speak lies, and they conceive mischief, and bring forth iniquity. They hatch the country's eggs, and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth. And that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the acts of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us. Neither does justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar like bears and mourn like doves. You see these people mourning? Perverse people. Sinful people. They will not repent of their sins. They will not turn away from their sins. And they just mourn and mourn. And the promise of Jesus when he said, Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. It's not for the profane mourners. Number six, the presumptuous mourners. I'm looking at Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 7, we're looking at it from verse 5. Zechariah chapter 7, we're looking at verse 5. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? You see, for seventy years, these people continued and they were mourning and fasting, mourning and fasting regularly. And yet, God said, All those seventy years when you did that, do you think you were doing that to me? Could I have blessed that? Could I have given you the fulfillment of the promise that I'm making to do so sincerely mourn? No, I could not. In verse 6, and when ye did eat, and when ye did drink, did not, did not ye eat for yourselves, and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which the Lord has cried by the former prophets, when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south and the plain, jump down to verse 11. In verse 11 it says, But they refused to hack him, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent, in his spirit by the former prophets therefore there came a great wrath from the lord of hosts Do you see that they were mourning they mourned regularly but the lord didn't answer their prayers even though they mourned you'll see judgment on them because they were living in sin and because these were presumptuous people and then number seven the proud mourners the proud mourners job chapter 2 in job chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 11 job chapter 2 verse 11 now when job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him they came every one from his place and then at the latter part of that verse it says to come to mourn with him and to comfort him to, to come to mourn with him and to comfort him what kind of uh, comforters were they what kind of mourners were they look at chapter 16 verse 2 
I have had many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Miserable comforters are ye all. They just came and they were saying they were more righteous than Job. They were higher than Job. They knew more than Job. They were so proud. And they thought that they were comforting Job. And he said, you people, you don't understand what you are doing. You are miserable comforters. In verse 3, shall vain words have an end? Or what in boldness thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as you do. If your soul were in my soul stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. What did God think about these people? What did God say about these people? Job chapter 42. I'm reading verse 7. In Job chapter 42 verse 7. And it, and it was so. That after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job. The Lord said unto Eliphaz the Temanite. My wrath is kindled against thee. And against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me. The thing that is right as my servant Job hath. So then you understand when it, the word of God says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. It's talking about special kind of mourners. It's not just talking about the general mourners, these professional mourners, these page mourners, these uh, uh, playful mourners, or these profane, perverse mourners, or the presumptuous mourners, or the proud mourners. What kind of mourners was he talking about? Let's come now to Matthew chapter 5. We're looking at verse 3. Verse 4 rather. Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. For you to fully understand. We're going to divide the study into three parts. Number one. Causes of heart breaking mourning. Causes of heart breaking mourning. Number two. Confession of humble mourners. The confession of humble mourners. Number three, comfort for honest mourners. We're looking at number one, the causes of heart breaking mourning. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 again, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. After we have spoken about those who do not have right to claim this promise, and this promise is not for those other people. What kind of mourners are we talking about? Number one, the sincere mourners. The sincere mourners. Something has happened. It grieves them. It pierces them. And their hearts are preach. And they are sorrowful. And they come before the Lord in all sincerity. These sincere mourners. Number two, these are sober mourners. They are very sober they have considered what they should have got and they have considered what they have lost. They have considered the loss that they had, the death, spiritual death that has taken place. As a result of that, they became sober. Number three, sorrowful mourners. They were not superficial. Deep, deep in their hearts, they were sorrowful. And these sincere, sober, sorrowful mourners, they will come to the Lord in total contrition. In total repentance. And as they came to the Lord like that, the assurance of the Lord is blessed at those that mourn in that proper way, in that right way, in that scriptural way, because they shall be comforted. What kind of mourners are these? Number four, these are the self abasing mourners. They are base self. They go low in the dust. Actually, in those days, they even sprinkled dust and ashes upon their head. To show that we're just of earth. We should be crawling on the ground. We should be rolling on the ground. Because of what has happened unto us. The self abasing busy mourners. Number five. These were the sin hating mourners. Our sins have brought us to this situation. Our misdeeds have brought us to this situation. Our misconduct has brought us to this situation. Our disobedience has brought us to this situation. And we hate the very thing that brought us into that very situation. And when we mourn like that, hating the thing that brought us into that evil, into that degradation or destitution, blessed are the people that mourn in such ways because they shall be comforted. In number six, the Savior-seeking mourners. The Savior-seeking mourners. They're looking for mercy. 
They're asking for forgiveness. They're asking for the favor of God. They're asking for the grace of God. And in their heart, they're breathing their prayers unto God that, oh God, we know we have gone astray. We're seeking the Savior. And we're seeking the salvation of the Lord. These, these Savior-seeking mourners, it says, they'll be comforted. And then number seven is submissive mourners. They're submissive. They say, oh Lord, we know you have appointed the Lord. And we know that this raw chastisement or this punishment or this calamity or this thing that has happened to us is of our own making. We know it's because of the fulfillment of the law of sowing and reaping. If we sow to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. What else could we have got? We know that this is our fault. If we had been walking right and living right and doing everything according to the perfect will of the Lord, we know your promise will get water out of the rock and honey out of the rock. If there is destitution, if there is destruction, if there is death, if there is poverty, if there is famine, if there is suffering, oh Lord, we brought days upon ourselves and we submit under the rod appointed by the divine hand. Those are the mourners that will be answered by the Lord. Those are the mourners that will be comforted by the Lord. Look at that again. Blessed are they that mourn. You see that? Having the right attitude in that morning. And then the Lord said, for they shall be comforted. Let's come back to uh, Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm reading from verse 11. Uh, you will see then what the Lord is telling us. The right attitude in mourning. The right disposition in mourning and the right approach unto the Lord. When you are mourning for something, when you are mourning the loss of a privilege in the kingdom. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 59 verse 11. We roar all like bears and mourn so like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgression are multiplied before thee. You, you see that? You see the right confession of the people. Our transgressions are multiplied before thee. And then it says, and our sins testify against us. Our consciences are so heavy. Our consciences are so troubled. And our memory reminding us of what we have done, they testify against us. Our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. You see, those are the rightful mourners. Those are the people that are serious and sincere mourners. Those are the scriptural mourners. Those are the people that have the blessing of the Lord. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. And then it says in verse 13, in transgression and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. You know, they began to say, now we, we can recollect. Now we can tell. Now we know what we have done. And we know why what is happening to us has happened to us. You see, such people, it will not take them a long time. And the Lord will comfort them. Comfort them with forgiveness. Comfort them with redemption. And comfort them with salvation. And comfort them with the fulfillment of the promise of God. In verse 14, and judgment is turned away backward. And justice standeth afar off. For truth is falling in the street, and equity cannot enter. You see what the people are saying? They just say, we know. We know the degradation. We know how far we have gone. That on the streets, the neighbors are not even speaking truth with themselves. Because of how far we have gone away from the truth of the Lord, that's why we're suffering the way we're suffering. And blessed are these mourners that are sincere. Blessed are these mourners that are sorrowful. Blessed are these mourners that are sober. Blessed are these people that obey self and hate their sin. And now they're seeking the mercy and the grace and the salvation from the Savior. Blessed are these people because they're submissive mourners. And they say, yes, Lord, we understand. You are righteous and we are sinful. And they really mourn for their sins. Look at Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. I'm reading from verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence thou, and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, 
saying unto thy seed when I give it and I will send an angel before thee uh, uh, listen to this first almighty God said when he called Moses he said Moses I have seen the affliction of my people Israel I am come down, I, Almighty God, I am come down to deliver them out of the captivity and the slavery of Egypt. And then I will rejoice over them. I will deliver them. It's like he will hold them by their, he even said, he carried them like the eagles will carry the young ones. And then take them high and take them, transport them to the land of promise. It was a joyful time, a time of fellowship, a time of the mercy of God, a time of the promise of God, a time when the love of God was just flowing to them. And they had, they had this need, it was supplied. They had this other need, it was supplied. This other need, it was supplied. Do you remember? Manna every day. The pillar of, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And everything, it was just a great fellowship. Then eventually in the previous chapter, God said, Moses, come up to the mountain top. Because our relationship will not be a lawless relationship. It will not be a, a relationship without principle, without a pattern, without something for you to do. Come and receive the law that I'm going to give to the children of Israel so that they will understand how they are going to work with me. And Moses went to the mountain top. And before he came back, they all went into idolatry. Unbelievable. And then God said, go back to your people. And then he came back, he saw all of them, they were dancing around the car, an idol. O Israel, these be thy gods that delivered thee out of the land of Egypt. And then, you know, the whole story. Eventually, Moses was pleading with them. And God said, all right, I cannot go with you anymore. I will send an angel to take you to the land. You want the gift, you don't want the giver. You want the blessing, you don't want the blesser. You want the, the thing that you want, the land flowing with milk and honey, but you don't want the creator of the land flowing with milk and honey. I'll send an angel with you, he'll take you to the land. For many people today, oh, they'll say that's all right. Many people that run to many churches, they don't care to have the savior. They don't care to have the deliverer. They want the deliverance. They don't care to have the one that actually, the redeemer. All they want is just the deliverance and the blessing and the redemption. Everything they can have. Give me the healing. Whether I have the healer or not, that's not my problem. But you see, they understood what the Lord was saying. When the Lord said, I'm going to send an angel with you, he created me. The creator will not go with you. The almighty will not go with you. The El Shaddai will not go with you. The all-sufficient one will not go with you. I'm going to send an angel with you. Look at their response. Let me read from verse 2 now. And I will send an angel before thee. And I will drive out the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hevites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, stop for a moment, stop for a moment. And you know, many people going to church today, I, 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 sometimes I'm very sad that people don't understand the basic things in the Bible. Once there is healing, once there is manna, once there is, once there is what they call blessing in quotes, they are all happy and they are rejoicing. Even though they do not have the Lord and they do not have the Savior. And he said, well, God, something great. Look at this. Hear my testimony. My friend, look at these people. When God said, I'll send an angel to take you to the land, but I will not go with you myself. The Bible says, when they had this evil tiding, bad news, bad news, having the healing without the healer, bad news, having the deliverance without having the deliverer, that's bad news. Having the things of this life, but not having the creator of the heavens and the earth. Not having God as your father. Not having Jesus as your savior. Bad news. When the people had that evil tidings, look at it in verse, in verse 4. When the people had these evil tidings, they mourned. And no man did put on on him his ornaments. 
Those were the people that really understood and they knew what it meant to mourn. First Corinthians chapter 5. In First Corinthians, New Testament, First Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 1. First Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, it is reported commonly among, that there is fornication among you. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should take is father's wife. Uh, this is talking to the church at Corinth. The church at Corinth, again here was their peculiar problem. Uh, they, they had uh, the gifts of the spirit, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Discerning of spirits, dream and interpretation of dreams, prophecy, faith, to move mountains away, dynamic, real souls turning miracles they were having, and it came to their worship every time. And then they rattle out in tongues, and this one is speaking in tongues, that one is interpreting, and yet there was terrible fornication among them. And they were puffed up, and there was no mourning. And Paul the apostle was saying, and he had puffed up, and had not rather mourned that she that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. That's what the Lord expects, that when there is sin in the camp, sin in the congregation, instead of just going on with worship as usual, business as usual, speaking in tongues as usual, a fellowship as usual, programs as usual, and rejoicing. Isn't our church a great church? Isn't our congregation a great congregation? And then we are puffed up. It says we should rather mourn when there is sin in the congregation of the people of God. That's what the Lord is expecting us to do. When your friend has gone into sin, and you know that this, my friend, has backslidden. Instead of still holding hands and rejoicing and singing and saying, praise the Lord, after all, you have not run away from the church. And uh, what are they talking about? It says you mourn. You mourn. You are sorrowful because your friend is dead. A backslider is dead. Or when you yourself, when you have gone into sin, Instead of still carrying on worship as usual and program as usual and ministry as usual, you mourn. That's the mourning that the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Second Corinthians chapter 7. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 7, it says in verse 7, And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. This Second Corinthians, after First Corinthians, when Paul the apostle told them, you didn't do well. Still smiling and laughing in fellowship and worship, speaking in tongues and carrying on as usual. When there's fornication in the camp, you should have mourned. Then they mourned. Then they said it's true, we didn't do right. They didn't reject the message. They didn't rebel against the message. They didn't refuse the message. They didn't rebuke the messenger. They mourned. They accepted. And they knew that they were wrong. And then as they mourned, Paul the apostle had the report from the, uh, from the one that he sent there. He said, I'm rejoicing now because the word of God has a place in your heart. Because now I learned that when you receive the first epistle, the first letter, that you actually mourn. Then in verse 8 he said, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I made you sorry. I was hard. I was tough for you. And I really put it on you because you didn't do the right thing. Yes, I made you sorry with a letter. I do not regret. I do not repent. Though I did regret, I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle that made you sorry, though it was but for a season. Now, I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that 
ye might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, not to be regretted of, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow walketh repentance to salvation, but the sorrow of the world walketh death. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 53. <clears throat> Horror has taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Horror has taken hold upon me because I look at the wicked people that are forsaking the word of God. Verse 136, 136. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. He said, I'm so sorrowful and weeping every time because these people, they are not keeping the word of the Lord. You see, when there is personal sin, there will be mourning. There should be mourning. When we have the people's sin, then there should be mourning. And when there is a prince's sin, like Samuel, like Saul rather, he went to the battlefield. And Samuel, the prophet that appointed him and instructed him, this is what you do when you get there. He got there, he did the wrong thing. And he spared the good sheep over there. And then he even spared Agag. And then he came back and Samuel said, So what have you done? Oh, he said, I've obeyed the word of the Lord. And the people took the sheep, the best of the sheep, to sacrifice to your God. And Samuel said, Stay, and let me tell you what the Lord has told me to tell you. When you were small in your sight, when you were little in your sight, when you were nobody in your own sight, the Lord appointed you. And now he has appointed and he sent you out to go and do something. And you have disobeyed the Lord. Your kingdom will not continue. And then Samuel went back and he, he mourned and mourned and mourned. Until God said, Samuel, I've rejected the man. Why are you still mourning? Oh, get to Jesus' house and appoint me another king. But you see, when the princes, when the leaders, when the ministers, when they sin, those of us who are members of the church, we will mourn. You know, it's so surprising and so shocking. If, for example, you are a member of the church and you hear that the one that led you to the Lord that has gone into sin and he has been stalled for ministry, and then you don't feel it at all. What kind of heart do you have? If you have the mind of Christ and you are in agreement with the word of God, you will mourn. This is the minister, this is the pastor, this is the preacher, this is the teacher that led you to the Lord. It will make you to mourn. You will not be gossiping, just talking about it, just laughing and smiling. It will really pierce your heart. Another reason why people mourn when there's perpetual sinning perpetual sinning when God says over and over and over and over Israel Judah this is not right this is not the way get up stand before me walk before me and be thou perfect and yet there's continual sinning perpetual sinning it shall cause mourning in the midst of the people of God number five predicted suffering when God now says, <clears throat> as a result of what you have done, here is what I'm going to do. And there is no reverse. I'm not going to change it. Judgment is going to come. The people will mourn. When there's protracted sickness or when there's painful separation, it will cause mourning. I come, back, I come to point number two. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. Matthew chapter 5 verse 4. The confession of true mourners. Confession of true mourners. It says in verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The people that mourn will confess, will confess. But when I say confess, once again, we have to come to a area of confession. There are times when confessions are not sincere. When confessions are not faithful, when confessions are not truthful, and when it says, blessed are they that mourn, yes, mourners will confess, we have gone astray. We have died spiritually. 
We're no more in fellowship with the Lord. We need to be reunited, reconnected back to the Lord. But you see that confession may come sincerely or insincerely. Let me show you some examples. In Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. And I'm reading to you from verse 27. Exodus chapter 9. Reading from verse 27. Here it says, And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, and said unto them, I have sinned this time. Look at that. Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron, and then he bent low before them. He said, Moses, can I tell you what's my heart now? I have sinned. I have seen this time the Lord is the Lord is righteous and I and my people are wicked would you say that's the confession of somebody mourning rightly for sin let's look at verse 34 and when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased he sinned yet more and hardened his heart he and his servants you see that kind of confession? I have sinned. I have sinned. And that's why you find people that go to church almost every Sunday. Oh Lord, we have sinned. We have done what we shouldn't have done. We have not done what we should have done. And you know, sometimes they will just uh, separate a particular period of the year. They call it plenty season. It's sorrowful. It's mourning season. A sorrowful season when they come before the Lord and they bend low and they will not eat from morning until evening and they're just saying, Lord, we have sinned. Lord, we have sinned. Forgive the sins of your people. We are sinners. We recognize we are sinners. And you will think that they were really repenting just like Pharaoh. We, I have sinned. And yet, after the problems were over, he continued to sin yet more. You see, that is not acceptable in the sight of the Lord. Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 34. Numbers 22, verse 34. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. Oh, you'll think this man has repented. Do you know why many people might even confess and they, they say they have sinned and yet there's no forgiveness and there's no salvation and there's no peace of mind and the judgment of God is not lifted away from them because the confession is not real. And look at the next thing he said, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. It's still saying it. After he said, I have sinned. Then he now said, all right, if you don't want me to go, what did you say you have sinned? You see that kind of confession? And are we having that kind of confession in our relationship with God? That the Lord is challenging you about something. And the Lord is condemning a particular sin in your life. And then you come to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. When you hear a message. And then you go back after that Bible study, after that revival hour, after that Sunday worship, and you keep on doing the same thing. And then you're saying, oh, Lord, if you don't want me to do this, tell me. What did you say you have sinned? If you're still going to ask the question, if you don't want you to do this. It means that that confession is not real. You see, the Lord wants people who are sincere, who are humble, who are honest before him. Those are the people that mourn in the right sense. In Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 20. Joshua chapter 7 verse 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. What kind of confession was that? After 36 people had died as a result of his sin. After they had to make investigation after investigation after investigation. After they had to pray and fast before they would, before they would be able to discover who had done the thing eventually. After many souls were lost. After many lives had gone. After many people had died. Achan came forward and said, okay, I, I can. Let me tell you the real truth. Indeed, I have sinned. Are you like that? 
that your sin is costing real death of people, spiritual death of other people. And many people are going astray. Many people are dying. And then after we have investigated and fasted and prayed and, you know, the word of knowledge, every day you come out, okay, it's, it's true. I have sinned. Why all that kind of interview before you confess? Why all the trouble before you confess? Why do we have to go through all those processes before you come out like Achan? I have seen. That's not real. If you are real before the Lord, if your confession is humble and sincere, before all the investigation, voluntarily yourself say, well, I have seen. I'm sorry about it. And I'm changing. I'm turning around. I'm not going to do it anymore. That's the confession the Lord is expecting. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 24. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Saul, is that not too late? But you told Samuel, I have obeyed the word of the Lord. I have done everything the Lord wanted me to do. Until Samuel said, what minute the bleating of the sheep I hear in my ears. It's after the interview, the questioning, and all the other things that Saul eventually said in verse 24. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I want you to look at verse 30 and look at whether this a kind of confession to say or not then he said i have seen yet honor me now i have seen yet honor me now do you see that is that the confession of somebody wanting real salvation wanting real forgiveness he was so concerned about his prestige about his name about his position Oh yes, privately between you and I, Samuel, I have sinned. But honor me now before the people. Remember, I'm the king. You know, David did not do that to Nathan. Nathan came to David and told him the parable. And then David made the judgment. And then Nathan said, thou art the man. And then David said, I have sinned. I have sinned. I have sinned. He didn't say, Nathan, honor me. Exalt me. Cover me up. Don't talk about it. He didn't say that. Just, I have seen. You see the attitude of this, Saul. And then now in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 41. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Reading from verse 41. Here we find a group of people, all that I've been reading to you, those who are individuals. Here we have a group of people in verse 41. Then ye answered and said unto me, we have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. You know, an individual may be sincere in his confession. A group of people may be sincere in their confession. You see, this group of people came to Moses and they said, Moses, uh, we came as a group. What have you come to do? We have come to tell you that we realize we have sinned as a group of people. All right, what are you going to do now? Look at the middle of that verse. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. And when ye are guarded on every man his weapon of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, say unto them, go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. You see, these people came and they said, Moses, we have sinned as a group. And then Moses said, all right, the Lord is telling me to tell you. Don't do anything now. Don't minister now. Don't go and fight now. Ah, this, ah, that's the area we will not agree. We have confessed that we have sinned. That thing you are saying, God has said now, don't go up to fight that one. We're going to disobey. What kind of uh, repentance is that? What kind of confession is that? Do you see there are many people that are thinking, blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. And the morning they are talking about is not real, it's not deep, it's not sincere. Look at verse 43. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, 
but rebelled against the commandments of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites which dwelt in that mountain came out against you and chased you as bees do and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormon. And ye returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord will not hearken unto your voice, nor give ear unto you. You see, if we're, if we're repenting and we're saying that we have sinned, then we ought to do it the right way. It's not just to say that we have money and make it superficial, something that doesn't really reach the very heart. And let's now come back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, they that mourn, that really mourn, from the depths of their heart. And they are sorrowful for what has happened. They are not just regretting the act, the result or the reward or the recompense of their action. They are really sorrowful because of the sin. And then it says, for they shall be comforted. Let's see the real confession of humble mourners. In Psalm 38, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 38, reading from verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasing me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows stick fast in me, and thine hand presseth me so. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. You see, the man realized this is David. He said, Lord, you are right. You are righteous. You are upright. This is not your fault. Everything happening to me, this is because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As an heavy burden, dear, too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. See a king praying like this. He said, you are right, O oh God. You are upright, O oh God. You are righteous, O oh God. I am the guilty one. This is because of my foolishness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. For my loins are filled with a loathsome disease. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and so broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. That was a sincere man. In Psalm 51, Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Do you realize that David was a king? Even if he prayed like this before the Lord, why did he write it down for other people to read? Why is he making it public? And that's what people don't want. They don't want publicity. They don't want anything that will show. Them. They want, they're like Saul. Samuel, prophet, Samuel, preacher, Samuel, pastor. I know I have sinned, but honor me before the people. And if you ever dare say anything by illustration, by insinuation, by whatever method, for anybody to know, then they say, okay, since you have made it public now, I'm really going to rebel. Because now you are making people to look at me as if I'm the worst person in the whole congregation. David didn't do that. David just said, whatever consequence is my fault. If there's no fire, there will be no smoke. If I didn't do evil, uh, the preacher will not talk about it. If I didn't sin, the, the illustration of the pastor will not bother me. Since I knew that by the grace of God I'm clean, I'm righteous, it won't bother me at all. Uh, if, if anybody looks at me after the illustration in the preaching, it's my fault. It's my sin. It's my backsliding. 
and there will be no rebellion at all. You see, you see what David did after he prayed the prayer in private, and then the Lord had forgiven him for the benefit of other people. He wrote everything down. He said, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden parts, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with his own. And I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities, creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. You see there how that individual really confessed, and it was uh, something very sincere, very uh, heart touching, heartfelt. In uh, Proverbs chapter 28, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. How do people cover their sins? Number one, by just being quiet. Just, just quiet. And allow time to cover everything. And allow the conscience to, you know, stop making a noise. Just be quiet. That's covering the sin. And he that covers his sin shall not prosper. How do people cover their sins? By argument. No, not me. No, but this is what we saw. This is what we heard. No, not me. Flash denial. And by that denial, that is a covering of sin. And you see there are people that think if they cover their sins like that, then they continue in ministry. What's the use of a farmer going to the farm to plant when there's not going to be any crop? What's the use of a child going to the school to take exam when there's not going to be any good result? What's the use of anybody going to do a particular work when there's not going to be any benefit? What's the use of ministry and preaching when there's not going to be any result? There'll be no reward. He that covereth a sin shall not prosper. The work of his son will not prosper. His ministry will not prosper. Because, you see, he's covering up sin. And you confess that sin, you forsake that sin, you expose it, and then it is forgiven, and then God releases you in ministry. How many people in this world, in the church at large, I don't mean just our church here, church at large, that those preachers, those pastors, those evangelists, they're living in real sin, terrible sin, flagrant sin, shameful sin, and yet they cover it up. And because they know how to preach, they know how to talk, they know how to pray, they know how to do this and how to do that, but it will not prosper. He that covereth a sin shall not prosper in verse 13, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And that's what the Lord is expecting, confession and forsaking of that sin in Second Chronicles chapter 7. Second Chronicles Chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 14. Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. That's the first step. Shall humble themselves. Shall humble themselves. It takes humility. You know, after we have studied the Bible and we know that the word of God is real, and the Lord will not allow that particular sentence to leave your heart. And he says, that's for you. You know it, that's for you. And then at the time where to pray, you have to humble yourself first. Without humility, you'll be looking around. Because you're looking for honor. You're looking for the praise of men. You're looking for appreciation. You're looking for promotion. You're looking for exaltation. You'll be looking around. How neat I am. How dignified I am. How respected I am. How exalted I am. And until you come out from that tower and then you humble yourself. We're talking about getting to heaven. 
We're talking about having the favor of God. We're talking about having the, the salvation of the Lord, having what it will take for you to get to heaven, that you humble yourself, that you realize you can die anytime. And if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, your conscience is bothering you on that thing because it's wicked. The Spirit of God is pointing to that thing because it's wicked. And the Lord is saying, how long are you going to be in controversy with the Almighty God? But if you turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Look up at me here. You know, sometimes there is something you could have settled within five minutes. And I can tell you, there are people that have done exactly the same thing that is bothering your heart now. The thing that is churning in your heart and turning you and making you to have sleepless nights. That in the night you remember you are, you are restless. There are the people that have done exactly the same thing. But within five minutes, they have summed up the courage. And then they have come to the Lord and have said, Lord, whatever it takes, I'm going to clean my sledge. I'm going to make this thing right. And it didn't take them 10 minutes and they made everything right and the Lord gave them the grace and they went to the people they offended. Well, my dear sister, I'm sorry about it. And the sisters, oh, I'm, don't worry about this. And then their conscience is now free and clear. This thing you are battling with, it, within five minutes you could have settled everything. Other people have settled it. And then you are still killing yourself because of that thing. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and will pray, and will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. And then it says, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 4. I'm coming now to point number 3. Comfort for honest mourners. Comfort for honest mourners. Blessed a day that morn, for they shall be comforted. The comfort of the Lord that comes to us when it says they shall be comforted. I wish I had the time to show you the scriptures. How the comfort will come from all directions. When you have sincerely mourned, how God himself the creator of the heavens and the earth brings the comfort to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. The God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tri tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble and by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You see, God comes to you directly and he comforts you and he says, never mind, your sins are forgiven. Never mind, I overlook all that thing. Never, never mind, it's like you never sinned in your life. Almighty God himself coming to you and comforting you. I have about the Lord Jesus Christ in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 16 and verse 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 16. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself. And God, even our Father, which has loved us and has given us everlasting consolation and good hope, through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The Lord Jesus Christ himself gets involved. When the Father Almighty and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son and the Savior, they come to you and then you are comforted. What comfort that will be? John chapter 14. John chapter 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit himself also coming to comfort you. And then he brings comforting scriptures, encouraging scriptures, scriptures that will act like real water to cool your heart 
bringing everything to your heart. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit coming to comfort you. In uh, Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning. That we through the through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Through patience and comfort. Comfort of the scriptures. How many times have you, if you're a sincere mourner, if you're a sober mourner, if you're a sin-hating mourner, if you're a savior-seeking mourner, if you're a self-abasing mourner, if you're a submissive mourner, sometimes you know you are mourning like that, you're unhappy, you are sorrowful, you are dejected, you are discouraged. Why is my life like this? Why am I like this? Why am I like that? Then you just open the Bible without even wanting to open it, open any part. You just open the Bible and the Holy Spirit directs your eyes to a particular verse brings joy in your soul satisfaction in your heart that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope the father comforting you the son comforting you the spirit comforting you and the scripture comforting you how about the fellow workers that you know in these days of gsm that somebody will just text you well, and, and the verse is coming from nowhere the lord he, maybe he was sleeping at night and god just woke him up and it's a fellow minister, a fellow believer. And then he sends a text to you, a comforting scripture. And then you pick up the phone like this to see that you say, what, how God loves me so much. How did this person know that this is exactly what I need at this time, at this hour? Because you mourn in the right sense, in the right way. And blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. When last did somebody send this, a verse of scripture to you? That comforted your heart, that wiped away your tears, that brought a solace, consolation, and peace in your mind. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. Colossians chapter 4, I'm reading verses 10 and 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister, son, to Barnabas, uh, touching whom you received a uh, commandment. If he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justus, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. They have been a comfort unto me. The Lord just put in the right word in, the right, in their mouths at the right time. To send the word of comfort unto you. You see, that's how God comforts us. God Almighty himself. Jesus Christ himself. The Holy Spirit himself, and then the scriptures, and then the fellow workers. How about the brethren in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Chapter 5, verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. In verse 14, now, we exhort you, brethren, one them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and be patient toward all men. Other brethren comforting you. And then even you yourself, even you yourself, that you come, uh, the, the Lord will make you to know how to receive the comfort directly by yourself in Psalm 119, verse 52. Psalm 119, verse 52. I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. I've comforted myself. You just wake up maybe in the night. And instead of just, you know, rolling on the bed and being uneasy and having almost headache in the dead of the night, the scriptures will be coming to your heart. You'll be appropriating the scriptures of comfort in your life. Because it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's comfort on earth. How about when we eventually get on the other side? And then the Lord himself will comfort you on the other side of the grave. We're looking at Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 19. And there was a certain rich man 
which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and designing to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime hast received thy good things and like what Lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented now he is comforted now he is comforted and that's the final one that's the eternal one he comforts you here on earth and then he comforts you in eternity and you know what it takes just to be sincere before the lord and go before the lord and sincerely be sorrowful for your sin and turn away from that sin and blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer and say lord this is your word we're going to make good use of your word blessed are they that mourn blessed are they that mourn they shall be comforted the lord is nearby and he knows how sincere we are how sober we are how sorrowful for things wrong we might have done we are or maybe we've not done anything wrong others have done wrong and we know it and it concerns us and you are, you are concerned for the glory of God. And you are saying, oh Lord, I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Whenever I see people not obeying your word, I'm concerned. Whenever I see people that are trampling upon your word, I'm concerned. Whenever I see people that do not respect, do not honor your glorious name, I'm concerned. I mourn not because I have sin. I mourn because they sin. I mourn because they do not honor you. I mourn because they do not go the right way. I mourn because I see a lot of hypocrisy. And the Lord said, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Recollect. Remember. What's your life like? Are you trying to make yourself like Pharaoh? You recognize where sin is. And yet, even though you might say, one day I have sinned, I'm sorry. The next day you're hiding your heart and you do more evil. Is that the right attitude? Is that how to mourn in the sight of the Lord? Would you be like Balaam, confessing, I have sinned. And then after you confess, then you say, okay, if that offends you, I will do no more. Why use the word if again? Why don't you recollect and look at your life? And let the Lord himself purge, cleanse, wash you with the blood of the Lamb. Are you like Saul? You're too much concerned about the opinions of men about you. Too much concerned about the praise of men. About the honor that comes from man. The glory that comes from man. I have sinned, but honor me before the people. That will not be a right attitude. The glory of the Lord alone should be our concern. When somebody loses father or mother and a fellow is crying, oh, she doesn't, she doesn't think about what people think about her. He doesn't think about what people think about her, about him. 
when somebody loses a loved one and it's money sincerely it's not concerned about what people think what people say and if you're really concerned about the glory of God and you really sincerely mourn, you'll not be concerned about what people do, what people say, how people act, when people look at you, when people see you. That will not be your concern. Your concern will be you've done something wrong in the sight of God. You want his forgiveness, you want his favor, you want his grace, you want his salvation, and you want his, his fellowship again. That will be your concern. All those other things will not be your concern at all. Not what they say. Not how they look at me. Not the honor I'm going to get from the people. Not the praise of men. What's your concern? Is your confession like that of Achan? After lives have been lost. After your sin has brought many others into trouble. After a lot of interview, a lot of investigation, a lot of questioning. Then eventually you say, okay, I have sinned. That will not be the right attitude. Is your confession like those of the Israelites? They came as a team to Moses. We have sinned. Then the very next moment, they rebelled against the word of God. Let the morning be sincere. Let it be sober. Let it have real sorrow of heart. It will lead you to hating the sin that you are mourning about. It will lead you to seek the mercy and the grace and the salvation from the Savior. It will lead you to have a new relationship, sensitive relationship with the Lord. And now you don't want to do anything that will make him unhappy. You want to please the Lord for the rest of your life. You want to serve him and love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's genuine money. That's scriptural money. That's a life changing money. Without that, there will be no change. And the Lord will not value. The kind of mourning that is just superficial. Settle everything with the Lord. And if you have to, if you have to settle anything with your fellow man, do it as well. Saturate once and for all and live a life of sincere fellowship of the Lord. A life the Lord can trust that now you are living according to his will. 